Section 9 of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. The Aeneid by Virgil. Translated by J. W. McKyle. Chapter 10 The Games of the Fleet. Part 1. Meanwhile, Aeneas and his fleet in unwavering track now held mid-passage, and cleft the waves that blackened under the north, looking back on the city that even now gleams with hapless Elissa's funeral flame. Why the broad blaze is lit lies unknown, but the bitter pain of a great love trampled, and the knowledge of what woman can do in madness, draw the Teucrian's hearts to gloomy guesses. When their ships held the deep, nor any land farther appears, the seas all round, and all round the sky, a dusky shower drew up overhead, carrying night and storm, and the wave shuddered and gloomed. Palinurus, master of the fleet, cries from the high stern, Alas, why have these heavy storm clouds girt the sky? Lord Neptune, what wilt thou? Then he bids clear the rigging and bend strongly to the oars, and brings the sails across the wind, saying thus, Noble Aeneas, not did Jupiter give word and warrant would I hope to reach Italy under such a sky. The shifting winds roar athwart our course, and blow stronger out of the black west, and the air thickens into mist. Nor are we fit to force our way on and across. Fortune is the stronger. Let us follow her and turn our course whither she calls. Not far away, I think, are the faithful shores of thy brother Eryx, and the Sicilian haven." if only my memory retraces rightly the stars I watched before. Then, good Aeneas, even I ere now discern the winds will have it so, and thou urgest against them in vain. Turn thou the course of our sailing. Could any land be welcomer to me, or where I would sooner choose to put in my weary ships, than this that hath Dardanian Acestes to greet me, and lapse in its embrace Lord Anchises's dust? This said, they steer for harbour, while the following west wind stretches their sails, the fleet runs fast down the flood, and at last they land joyfully on the familiar beach. But Acestes, high on a hilltop, amazed at the friendly squadron approaching from afar, hastens towards them, weaponed and clad in the shaggy skin of a Libyan she-bear. Him a Trojan mother conceived, and bore to Grimissus river. Not forgetful of his parentage, he wishes them joy of their return, and gladly entertains them on his rustic treasure and comforts their weariness with his friendly store. So soon as the morrow's clear daylight had chased the stars out of the east, Aeneas calls his comrades along the beach together, and from a mounded hillock speaks. Great people of Dardanus, born of the high blood of gods, the yearly circle of the months is measured out to fulfilment since we laid the dust in earth all that was left of my divine father, and sadly consecrated our altars. And now the day is at hand, this, O gods, was your will, which I will ever keep in grief, ever in honour. Did I spend it an exile on Gaetulian quicksands, did it surprise me on the Argolic Sea, or in my Kenai town, yet would I fulfil the yearly vows and annual ordinance of festival, and pile the altars with their due gifts. Now we are led hither, to the very dust and ashes of our father, not as I deem without divine purpose and influence, and borne home into the friendly haven. Up then, and let us all gather joyfully to the sacrifice. Pray we for winds, and may he deign that I pay these rites to him year by year in an established city and consecrated temple. Two head of oxen, Acestes, the seed of Troy, gives to each of your ships by tail. Invite to the feast your own ancestral gods of the household, and those whom our host Acestes worships. Further, so the ninth dawn uplift the gracious day upon men, and her shafts unveil the world, I will ordain contests for my Trojans, first for swift ships, then whoso excels in the foot-race, and whoso, confident in strength and skill, comes to shoot light arrows, or adventures to join battle with gloves of raw hide. Let all be here, and let merit look for the prize and palm. Now all be hushed, and twine your temples with boughs. 
so speaks he and shrouds his brows with his mother's myrtle so helimus does so aletes ripe of years so the boy ascanius and the rest of the people follow he advances from the assembly to the tomb among a throng of many thousands that crowd about him here he pours on the ground in fit libation two goblets of pure wine two of new milk two of consecrated blood and flings bright blossoms saying thus hail holy father once again hail ashes of him i saved in vain and soul and shade of my sire thou wert not to share the search for italian borders and destined fields nor the dim ausonian tiber thus had he spoken when from beneath the sanctuary a snake slid out in seven vast coils and sevenfold slippery spires quietly circling the grave and gliding from altar to altar his green chequered body and the spotted lustre of his scales ablaze with gold as the bow in the cloud darts a thousand changing dyes athwart the sun aeneas stood amazed at the sight at last he wound his long train among the vessels and polished cups and tasted the feast and again leaving the altars where he had fed crept harmlessly back beneath the tomb doubtful if he shall think it the genius of the ground or his father's ministrant he slays as is fit two sheep of two years old as many swine and dark-backed steers pouring the wild cups of wine and calling on the soul of great anchises and the ghost re-arisen from acheron Therewithal his comrades, as each hath store, bring gifts to heap joyfully on the altars, and slay steers in sacrifice. Others set cauldrons a row, and, lying along the grass, heap live embers under spits, and roast the flesh. The desired day came, and now the ninth dawn rose up clear and bright behind Phaeton's courses, and the name and renown of illustrious Acestes had stirred up all the bordering people. Their holiday throng filled the shore to see Aeneas's men, and some ready to join in contest. First of all, the prizes are laid out to view in the middle of the race-course. Tripods of sacrifice, green garlands and palms, the reward of the conquerors, armours and garments dipped in purple, talents of silver and gold. And from a hillock in the mist the trumpet sounds, the game's begun. First is the contest of rowing, and four ships matched in weight enter, the choice of all the fleet. Nathias's keen oarsmen drive the swift dragon, Nathias the Italian to be, from whose name is the Memnian family. Gaius the huge bulk of the huge Chimera, a floating town, whom her triple-tiered Dardanian crew urge on with oars rising in threefold rank. Sergestus, from whom the Sergian house holds her name, sails in the tall centre. And in the sea-coloured Scylla, Cloanthus, whence is thy family, Cluentius of Rome. Apart in the sea, and over against the foaming beach, lies a rock that the swollen waves beat and drown what time the northwestern gales of winter blot out the stars. In calm it rises silent out of the placid water, flat-topped, and a haunt where cormorants love best to take the sun. Here Lord Aeneas set up a goal of leafy ilex, a mark for the sailors to know whence to return, where to the wheel their long course round. Then they choose stations by lot, and on the sterns their captains glitter afar, beautiful in gold and purple, the rest of the crews are crowned with poplar sprays, and their naked shoulders glisten wet with oil. They sit down at the thwarts, and their arms are tense on the oars, at full strain they wait the signal while throbbing fear and heightened ambition drain their riotous blood then when the clear trumpet note rang all in a moment leap forward from their line the shouts of the sailors strike up to heaven and the channels are swept into foam by the arms as they swing backwards they cleave their furrows together and all the sea is torn asunder by oars and triple pointed prows not with speed so headlong do racing pairs whirl the chariots over the plain as they rush streaming from the barriers not so do their charioteers shake the wavy reins loose over their team and hang forward on the whip all the woodland rings with clapping and shouts of men that cheer their favourites and the sheltered beach eddies back their cries the noise buffets and re-echoes from the hills Gaius shoots out in front of the noisy crowd, and glides foremost along the water, whom Cloanthus follows next, rowing better, 
but held back by his dragging weight of pine. After them, at equal distance, the dragon and the centaur strive to win the foremost room, and now the dragon has it, now the vast centaur outstrips and passes her, now they dart on both together, their stems in a line, and their keels driving long furrows through the salt waterways. And now they drew nigh the rock, and were hard on the goal, when Gaius, as he led, winner over half the flood, cries out to Menoetes, the ship's steerman, Whither away so far to the right? This way direct her path. Kiss the shore, and let the oar-blades graze the leftward reefs. Others may keep to deep water. He spoke, but Menoetes, fearing blind rocks, turns the bow away towards the open sea. Whither wanderest thou away? To the rocks, Menoetes! again shouts Gaius, to bring him back. And lo, glancing round, he sees Cloanthus passing up behind and keeping nearer. Between Gaius's ship and the echoing crags, he scrapes through inside on his left, flashes past his leader, and leaving the goal behind, is in safe water. Then indeed grief burned fierce through his strong frame, and tears sprung out on his cheeks, heedless of his own dignity and his crew's safety. He flings the two cautious Menoetes sheer into the sea from the high stern himself succeeds as guide and master of the helm and cheers on his men and turns his tiller into shore but menoetes when at last he rose struggling from the bottom heavy with advancing years and wet in his dripping clothes makes for the top of the crag and sits down on a dry rock the teucrians laughed out as he fell and as he swam and laughed to see him spitting the salt water from his chest at this a joyful hope kindled in the two behind sir gestus and menestheus of catching up gaius's wavering course sir gestus slips forward as he nears the rock yet not all in front nor leading with his length of keel part is in front part pressed by the dragon's jealous prow but striding amidships between his comrades menestheus cheers them on now now swing back Oarsmen who were Hector's comrades, whom I chose to follow me in Troy's extremity, now put forth the might and courage you showed in Gaetulian quicksands, amid Ionian seas, and Malia's chasing waves. Not the first place do I now seek for Mnestheus, nor strive for victory, though, ah, yet let them win, O Neptune, to whom thou givest it. But the shame of coming in last, win but this, fellow citizens, and avert that disaster. His men bend forward, straining every muscle. The brasswork of the ship quivers to their mighty strokes, and the ground runs from under her. Limbs and parched lips shake with their rapid panting, and sweat flows in streams all over them. Mere chance brought the crew the glory they desired, for while Sir Gestus drives his prow furiously in towards the rocks, and comes up with too scanty room, alas, he caught on a rock that ran out, the reef ground, the oars struck and shivered on the jagged teeth, and the bows crashed and hung. The sailors leap up and hold her with loud cries, and get out iron-shod poles and sharp-pointed boat-hooks, and pick up their broken oars out of the eddies. But Nestheus, rejoicing and flushed by his triumph, with oars fast dipping and winds at his call, issues into the shelving water and runs down the open sea. As a pigeon, whose house and sweet nestlings are in the rock's recesses, if suddenly started from her cavern, wings her flight over the fields and rushes frightened from her house with loud clapping pinions, then, gliding noiselessly through the air, slides on her liquid way and moves not her rapid wings. So Mnestheus, so the dragon under him, swiftly cleaves the last space of sea, so her own speed carries her flying on and first Sir Gestus is left behind, struggling on the steep rock and shoal water, and shouting in vain for help, and learning to race with broken oars. Next he catches up Gaius and the vast bulk of the Chimera. She gives way without her steersman, and now on the very goal Cloanthus alone is left. Him he pursues and presses hard, straining all his strength. Then indeed the shouts redouble, altogether eagerly cheer on the pursuer, and the sky echoes their din. These scorn to lose the honour that is their own, the glory in their grasp, and would sell life for renown. To these success lends life, 
power comes with belief in it, and haply they carried the prize with prows abreast, had not Cloanthus, stretching both his open hands over the sea, poured forth prayers and called the gods to hear his vows. Gods who are sovereign on the sea, over whose waters I run, to your altars on this beach will I bring a snow-white bull, my vow's glad penalty, and will cast his entrails into the salt flood and pour liquid wine. He spoke, and far beneath the flood maiden Panopea heard him, with all Phorcus's choir of Nereids, and Lord Fortunus with his own mighty hand pushed him on his way. The ship flies to land swifter than the wind or an arrow's flight, and shoots into the deep harbour. Then the seed of Anchises, summoning all in order, declares Cloanthus conqueror by herald's outcry, and dresses his brows in green bay, and gives gifts to each crew, three bullocks of their choice, and wine, and a large talent of silver to take away. For their captains he adds special honours. To the winner a scarf wrought with gold, encircled by a double border of deep Melibrean purple. Woven in it is the kingly boy on leafy Ida, chasing swift stags with javelin and racing feet, keen and as one panting. Him Jove's swooping armour-bearer hath caught up from Ida in his talons, his aged guardians stretch their hands vainly upward, and the barking of hounds rings fierce into the air. But to him who, next in merit, held the second place, he gives to wear a corslet triple woven with hooks of polished gold, stripped by his own conquering hand from Demolius under tall Troy by the swift Simois, an ornament and safeguard among arms. Scarce could the straining shoulders of his servants Phegeus and Sagaris carry its heavy folds. Yet with it on, Demolius at full speed would chase the scattered Trojans. The third prize he makes twin cauldrons of brass, and bowls wrought in silver and rough with tracery. And now all moved away in the pride and wealth of their prizes, their brows bound with scarlet ribbons, when, hardly torn loose by all his art from the cruel rock, his oars lost, rowing feebly with a single tear, Sir Gestus brought in his ship, jeered at and unhonoured. Even as often a serpent caught on a highway, if a brazen wheel hath gone aslant over him, or a wayfarer left him half dead and mangled with the blow of a heavy stone, wreathes himself slowly in vain effort to escape, in part undaunted, his eyes ablaze and his hissing throat lifted high. In part, the disabling wound keeps him coiling in knots and twisting back on his own body. So the ship kept rowing slowly on, yet hoists sail and under full sail glides into the harbour mouth. Glad that the ship is saved, and the crew brought back, Aeneas presents Sergestus with his promised reward. A slave woman is given him, not unskilled in Minerva's labours, following the Cretan, with twin boys at her breast. This contest sped, good Aeneas moved to a grassy plain girt all about with winding wooded hills, and amid the valley an amphitheatre, whither, with a concourse of many thousands, the hero advanced and took his seat on a mound. Here he allures with rewards and offer of prizes those who will try their hap in the fleet foot-race. Trojans and Sicilians gather mingling from all sides. Nisus and Euryalus foremost. Euryalus in the flower of youth and famed for beauty, Nisus for pure love of the boy. Next follows renowned Diores of Priam's royal line, after him Salius and Patron together, the one Acarnanian, the other Tegean by family and of Arcadian blood. Next two men of Sicily, Helimus and Panopes, foresters and attendants on old Acestes, many besides whose fame is hid in obscurity. Then among them all Aeneas spoke thus, Hearken to this, and attend in good cheer. None out of this number will I let go without a gift. To each will I give two glittering Gnosian spearheads of polished steel, and an axe chased with silver to bear away. One and all shall be honoured thus. The three foremost shall receive prizes, and have pale olive bound about their head. The first shall have a caparisoned horse, as conqueror, the second an Amazonian quiver filled with the arrows of Thrace, girt about by a broad belt of gold, and on the link of the clasp a polished gem. Let the third depart with this Argolic helmet for recompense. 
this said they take their place and the signal once heard dart over the course and leave the line pouring forth like a storm cloud while they mark the goal nisus gets away first and shoots out far in front of the throng fleeter than the winds or the winged thunderbolt next to him but next by a long gap salius follows then left a space behind him euryalus third and helimus comes after euryalus and closer behind him lo diores goes flying just grazing foot with foot hard on his shoulder and if a longer space were left he would creep out past him and win the tie and now almost in the last space they begin to come up breathless to the goal when unfortunate nisus trips on the slippery blood of the slain steers where haply it had spilled over the ground and wetted the green grass here just in the flush of victory he lost his feet they slid away on the ground they pressed and he fell forward right among the ordure and blood of the sacrifice yet forget he not his darling euryalus for rising he flung himself over the slippery ground in front of salius and he rolled over and lay all along on the hard sand euryalus shoots by wins and holds the first place his friend gave and flies on amidst prosperous clapping and cheers behind helimus comes up and diores now third for the palm at this salius fills with loud clamour the whole concourse of the vast theatre and the lords who looked on in front demanding restoration of his defrauded prize euryalus is strong in favour and beauty in tears and the merit that gains grace from so fair a form diores supports him who succeeded to the palm so he loudly cries and bore off the last prize in vain if the highest honours be restored to salius then lord aeneas speaks for you o boys your rewards remain assured and none alters the prize's order let me be allowed to pity a friend's innocent mischance so speaking he gives to salius a vast gaetulian lion skin with shaggy masses of hair and claws of gold if this cries nisus is the reward of defeat and thy pity is stirred for the fallen what fit recompense wilt thou give to nisus to my excellence the first crown was due had not i like salius met fortune's hostility and with words he displayed his face and limbs foul with the wet dung his lord laughed kindly on him and bade a shield be brought forth the workmanship of didymaon torn by him from the hallowed gates of neptune's grecian temple with this special prize he rewards his excellence thereafter when the races are finished and the gifts fulfilled now he cries come whoso hath in him valour and a ready heart and lift up his arms with gauntleted hands so speaks he and sets forth a double prize of battle for the conqueror a bullock gilt and garlanded a sword and beautiful helmet to console the conquered straightway without pause dares issues to view in his vast strength rising amid loud murmurs of the people he who alone was wont to meet paris in combat he who at the mound where princely hector lies struck down as he came the vast bulk upborne by conquering booties of amicus's bebrician line and stretched him in death on the yellow sand such was dares at once he raises his head high for battle displays his broad shoulders and stretches and swings his arms right and left lashing the air with blows for him another is required but none out of all the train durst approach or put the gloves on his hands so he takes his stand exultant before aeneas's feet deeming he excelled all in victories and thereon without more delay grasps the bull's horn with his left hand and speaks thus goddess born if no man dare trust himself to battle to what conclusion shall i stand how long is it seemly to keep me bid me carry off thy gifts therewith all the dardanians murmured assent and bade yield him the promised prize at this aged acestes spoke sharply to entellus as he sate next him on the green cushion of grass entellus bravest of heroes once of old in vain wilt thou thus idly let a gift so great be borne away uncontested where now prithee is divine eryx thy master of fruitless fame where thy renown over all sicily and those spoils hanging in thy house thereat he desire of glory is not gone 
nor ambition checked by fear, but torpid age dulls my chilly blood, and my strength of limb is numb and outworn. If I had what once was mine, if I had now that prime of years, yonder braggart's boast and confidence, it had taken no prize of goodly bullock to allure me, nor heed I these gifts. So he spoke, and on that flung down a pair of gloves of giant weight, with whose hard hide bound about his wrists valiant Eryx was wont to come to battle. They stood amazed, so stiff and grim lay the vast sevenfold oxhide sewn in with lead and iron. Dares, most of all, shrinks far back in horror, and the noble son of Anchises turns round this way and that with their vast weight and voluminous folds. Then the old man spoke thus in deep accents. How had they seen the gloves that were Hercules' own armour, and the fatal fight on this very beach? These arms thy brother Eryx once wore. Thou seest them yet stained with blood and spattered brains. In them he stood to face great Alcides. To them was I used while fuller blood supplied me strength, and envious old age had not yet strewn her snows on either temple. But if Dares of Troy will have none of these our arms, and good Aeneas is resolved on it, and my patron Acestes approves, let us make the battle even. See, I give up the gauntlets of Eryx. Dismiss thy fears, and do thou put off thy Trojan gloves. So spoke he, and throwing back the fold of his raiment from his shoulders, he bears the massive joints and limbs, the great bones and muscles, and stands up huge in the middle of the ground. Then Anchises' lordly seed brought out equal gloves and bound the hands of both in matched arms. Straightway each took his stand on tiptoe, and undauntedly raised his arms high in the air. They lift their heads right back and away out of reach of blows, and make hand play through hand, inviting attack, the one nimbler of foot and confident in his youth, the other mighty in mass of limb, but his knees totter tremulous and slow, and sick panting shakes his vast frame. Many a mutual blow they deliver in vain, many an one they redouble on chest and side, sounding hollow and loud. Hands play fast about ear and temple, and jawbones clash under the hard strokes. Old Entellus stands immovable and strain, only parrying hits with body and watchful eye. The other, as one who casts mounts against some high city or blockades a hill fort in arms, tries this and that entrance, and ranges cunningly over all the ground, and presses many an attack in vain. Entellus rose and struck clean out with his right downwards. His quick opponent saw the descending blow before it came, and slid his body rapidly out of its way. Entellus hurled his strength into the air, and all his heavy mass, overreaching, fell heavily to the earth, as sometime on Erymanthus or mighty Ida a hollow pine falls torn out by the roots. Teucrians and men of Sicily rise eagerly. A cry goes up, and Acestes himself runs forward, and pityingly lifts his friend and birthmate from the ground. But the hero, not dulled nor dismayed by his mishap, returns the keener to battle, and grows violent in wrath, while shame and resolved valour kindle his strength. All afire he hunts Dari's headlong over the lists, and redoubles his blows now with right hand, now with left, no breath nor pause. Heavy as hailstones rattle on the roof from a storm-cloud, so thickly shower the blows from both his hands as he buffets Dari's to and fro. Then Lord Aeneas allowed not wrath to swell higher, or Entellus to rage out his bitterness, but stopped the fight and rescued the exhausted Dares, saying thus in soothing words, Unhappy! What height of madness hath seized thy mind? Knowest thou not the strength is another's, and the gods are changed? Yield thou to heaven! And with the words he proclaimed the battle over, but him his faithful mates lead to the ships, dragging his knees feebly, swaying his head from side to side, and spitting from his mouth clotted blood mingled with teeth. At summons they bear away the helmet and shield, and leave palm and bull to Entellus. At this the conqueror, swelling in pride over the bull, cries, Goddess born, and you, O Trojans, learn thus what my strength of body was in its prime and from what a death Dares is saved by your recall. He spoke, and stood right opposite in face of the bullock as it stood by, the prize of battle, 
then drew back his hand and swinging the hard gauntlet sheer down between the horns, smashed the bones in upon the shattered brain. The ox rolls over, and quivering and lifeless lies along the ground. Above it he utters these deep accents. This life, Eryx, I give to thee, a better payment than Darius's death. Here I lay down my gloves and unconquered skill. End of section 9